Hello, everybody. My name is Serafin. I'm the uh, CEO of Data Wallet. I'm here with my co-founder and CTO, Daniel Hawthorne. And uh, today, we're going to be talking about Data Wallet and how a blockchain-powered self-sovereign wallet can give you back data ownership and, in the process, put thousands of dollars back into your pockets. So uh, let's start things off by talking about the state of data. So uh, when we take a look at how many people we have on, in, on the internet, we're about 3.5 billion right now. That's up from 1 billion in 2005. And we'll be 4.5 billion by 2020. So we're 4.5x 4 4 growth over 15 years. Now things drastically change when you take a look at data creation. So in 2005, you created and consumed roughly 240 megabytes of data per day. And so right now, that number is already up to 6.4 gigabytes. By 2020, you'll be creating and consuming about 16 gigs of data each day. And so that is a 67x increase over those same 15 years. So it's not just a lot more people on the internet, but uh, everybody on the internet creates more data each and every day. And so firms are buying this data up like crazy because that basically fuels their operations from ad exchanges, social networks, video platforms, you name it. They all need the data to fuel their operations and give you good content. Now, how valuable is all of this data that they're buying like crazy? The last confirmed number that we have is 156 billion US dollars. Uh, Senate committee had a one-year investigation, and they found that that number was spent on personal data in 2012 in the US alone. And so if we take a look at how the data market expands, uh, data would actually already be the third most valuable uh, resource in 2012. By 2022, we can expect it to take over petroleum as the world's most valuable resource. Uh, we, of course, don't know where this stops, so this is a little bit exaggerated, but 2022, number one most valuable resource. Now, since it's so valuable and firms are buying it up like crazy, it's worth taking a look at how precisely companies buy all of this data. And so that is where companies called data brokers come into play. Those are companies that basically take the data you create, they scrape it behind your backs, put it into profiles, and sell it to the highest bidder. Now, that may be from stuff that you post on Facebook, that may be from shopping data from loyalty programs, or it may be more perfidious things, such in the case of Vizio. If you own a TV, you are probably subject to that. They installed a tracking software on your TV and matched the pixels it was displaying to a content library and reverse engineered what you were watching, and they sold that off to data brokers. Now, the drawbacks of that system are plenty, but there are three major ones. So first and foremost, data brokers, so the Vizio example, for instance, was deemed illegal. Normally, data brokers have access only to publicly available information or data that is licensed out to them by third parties. In, on, in the case of Facebook, for instance, that only amounts to roughly 7% of all data that is created. And that mostly pertains to demographic information, such as birth dates and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the rich data of posts and likes and all that type of stuff is off bounds for those data brokers. Secondly, it is required by those companies, since they scrape data from silos, to match it to data from other silos. And matching data from, say, Facebook to data from, say, Amazon is near impossible. And I'm going to give you an example in uh, one of the following slides. But the third drawback of the system is that those data brokers are centralized middlemen, and they are prone to being hacked, as we've seen in the case of Equifax. And that hack alone could reduce the credit ecosystem by 35 billion. So keep in mind, this is just one of thousands of data brokers out there. On the user side, you know, what does the current system mean to users? Well, it's probably best to take a look at what you would stand to make if you sold your data yourself. Now, in, 2000, in 2012, it would have not been that much, 400 bucks roughly, but based upon the expansion of the data brokerage market, this year alone, you would have made roughly $1,800. By 2022, $7,600. That's 11% of median household income. For millennials between 18 and 29, we're talking about $10,000 each year. So that is that universal basic income that everybody is talking about. That is that right here. And that is taken away from you right now by data brokers. On the enterprise side, the system doesn't work either. So I mentioned that I would show you an example, and this is one. If you actually have identifiers on your customers in the form of cookies, and you go to an ad exchange, and you try to retarget them and find them on other website, what, uh, websites, the chance that you actually find them again is 2.9%. Okay, 97.1% of your ad budget is simply freaking wasted. Now, 
Again, on the user side, you have no transparency. You have no idea who's doing the sourcing, what they're doing it for, who they are. You have no control, you have no ownership. On the enterprise side, bad quality data that leads to billions in spending wastage. How can we solve this? Well, it starts by letting people become their own data broker and letting them monetize their own data themselves. It starts with, number one, a self-sovereign wallet that belongs to you and only you, where you can collate all the data you create into one profile. Step two is giving you an ecosystem where you can actually unlock the value of your data by sharing it based upon expressive consent with interested companies. And three, by empowering people through a token that can actually power those transactions. And what, you, uh, what that results in is two things. So number one is earning token. So that is with regards to that 11 percent of median household income. You can, you can reclaim that by simply selling that data to the interested companies themselves. Secondly, you can also take your data, the collated data profile, which basically acts like an uh, online identity, and you can link that to services. So instead of personalizing a service like Spotify for like one or two years, you could link all your historic and real-time data and personalize it right away. And so I'm going to hand this over to uh, my CTO, Dan, who's going to talk about the technical implementation of this. OK. So we are BlockCon. So at the, dinner, at the center of our ecosystem is the smart contract. But everyone knows that to deliver on the vision of a self-sovereign wallet for tens of million people, even tens of thousands of people, we're talking about hundreds of megabytes of this collated encrypted data profile that we have. We're not going to do everything on the blockchain. It takes a village. And I think the village is actually an app metaphor. We need a lot of these transparent and audible software agents. And I think that it's really important here to make them uh, functionally, uh, functionally self-contained. I go and like, I look at centralized repositories, which are visually uh, transparent. However, it requires an immense amount of expertise and hours to actually s figure out, is there an error? If you make these things functionally self-contained, for instance, we have a encryption uh, module, which simply takes in a seed key, the encryption algorithm, and it's the port where they want to send the data to. My younger brother can debug this and tell me whether this is working or not. You post this in a canonical version on something like Docker, and this is a small piece of a larger village that can really be actually trusted. So another small component that we have, we have something that takes people's Twitter data in the form of a Twitter OAuth token, and it outputs a JSON structure that perfectly, uh, with, with, a, with known uh, structure. You take these two components already, put them together, you can start to imagine how we can have a very clearly defined, collated, encrypted data wallet. OK, so we need a lot of these transparent and audible software agents. We also need smart contracts. This allows us to do decentralized verification and execution. And then we have this immutable and persistent ledger, which everyone can then make sure they are hip to what's going on. And finally, our ecosystem has a lot of external applications, these silos where people create data, and also standalone machine learning algorithms on the enterprise side. So here's a little toy example. Again, we have some unified elements here, which are really actually five discrete functional modules. Uh, but I think the best way to understand how uh, the blockchain mediates provider and data, uh, re data requesters' interactions is to jump right in and look at the dynamic interaction of these components. OK. So I'm not going to have time to go through this in complete detail, but the basic idea is that these core components, which are all audible, you can go online, you can interact with them, you can be assure yourself they do that what we say that they do, and that is crucially important that we do what we say they do, because the source of the data is how you actually verify this. If you go and interact with a data broker, you're, and you ask, how do I know this is true, you get a, a smile and the bill. Here you can actually go in, and you can see where did it come from. Okay. And basically, what this, uh, what this system allows you to do is ensure both the integrity and the security of the data profile, whether it is locally ho uh, hosted, which is what we're working towards, or uh, hosted in the cloud as it is at the moment. We ensure that there's not a single vector of attack. We have a, a key server which separates that, and it's, uh, our double encryption scheme ensures that the only time that anyone, us or anyone else, can access a user's data is when the user expressively consents with the form of their private key. OK. So once a user creates their collated encrypted data profile, they can start to exchange, they can go look on the exchange for contracts that, that might interest them. And they have this nice high-level interface in native apps 
which tell them the who, what, where, why of the contract. What kind of data points do I need? Who's asking? What are they going to use it for? How much are they going to pay me? And they have this nice user interface, which is supported, of course, by these blockchain components, which they can, publicly available, go and see for the interested inquiring person. Okay. So if they find a contract that they like and they want to go engage with this, we can then show how this system allows for a secure encrypted data exchange, logging key components on the blockchain but not sending the data on the blockchain. Again, if we want to deliver for even tens of thousands of people with their hundred, hundreds of megabytes data profile, and we want to, with the mature ecosystem, allow them to share a substantial proportion of that with people every day, that's not going to happen on the blockchain. Okay, so what we do is after unpeeling double encryption keys, well, okay, assuming we've gone through the search phase, which uh, ensures that the, it's a viable contract, that the data provider actually has the data points specified in the smart contract, and that they, uh, that they fall within the demographic parameters that are specified, assuming that's all been done, we can go into the enactment phase. In the enactment phase, we peel back the double encryption for just the data points that are specified in the contract. We have those in the sandbox. We hash that. That goes on the blockchain. That's going to be one half of the handshake. We then take the public key that's from the data requester. We encrypt it. And at this point, that specified data points can only be read by the person who the data provider explicitly consented to share the data with. We take that encrypted data, and we send it to the specified port. The requester then unencrypts this, hashes it again, sends it to the blockchain. This is the easiest way of making that smart contract handshake, which is going to lead us to the resolution phase. You can specify arbitrary conditions that both sides mutually agree on. That's the simplest one. And in the resolution phase, then the escrow token is, uh, is finally released. OK. So that was very quick. And please reference the white paper for the in-depth treatment of this. Um, but that is how these components can do a simple data transaction. And what's really cool is that these simple, simple components can also allow for a much richer kind of exchange, which includes data products as well as data, uh, as well as token, as well as data. Um, so developers can take users' data and create a product around that, and within the confines of the contract, deliver it. And that is why we are developing our decentralized uh, data product app exchange, OK? So on this app exchange, and, and this app exchange allows uh, developers, AI engineers, data scientists to do what they do best, to build cool products with data without having to be a blockchain whiz. They interact with the data API, which is a nice interface that's above the smart contract layer. And they can do things like data requests, which is I just kind of ran us through. They can also do personal data products things where they take people's personal data, they build a product directly off that that's tailored to the person, hand it back. They can do augmented existing services. So instantly, as Seraphin was saying, customize something off the bat with people, years of people's personal data. Um, so, and we, we have this, uh, we're putting aside a substantial pool to support people developing in this ecosystem. But we are not alone. It's a real marketplace. Um, people can, Community members, people who are interested in decent products, can go and they can in, and they can proactively find a, a young product that they want to come to existence, a fledgling product, and they can take their hardware token and they can stake that for a future product. So there's a little crowdsourcing you can hear and people going with their feet. What's cool and unique about the uh, ecosystem actually is they can also go and they can stake their data. And this is very valuable to developers because this is actually the data that's going to be run on their development code, the, or sorry, their production code, right? Developers are no longer having to simulate what they think the data is going to look like. They have the production data right off the back, and this is really going to supercharge the ecosystem. And we've already built a lot of tools that are already innate and native to the ecosystem. We've already built a lot of pre-processing tools, a lot of AI tools, and a lot of uh, analyses. No one's going to have to reinvent the wheel. These modules are available to be built upon. OK. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Seraphim, who's going to talk about the next generation of these personalized products that are going to be built on this platform. 
Thanks. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a variety of use cases. One, for instance, being you're personalizing a platform such as Spotify, right? And let's actually go into that a little bit more. So personal AI concierges. Take, for instance, this beautiful car that Rolls-Royce is developing, the Vision GT or something like that. So core pillar of that ecosystem in the car is a personal AI concierge that is supposed to give you recommendations when you interact with it. The problem is, when you first interact with that system, you actually need to create a lot of data in order for that system to learn about you, right? That means in the first period of you using this platform, uh, it is not only not usable, but it's actually a pain in the ass because it's going to give you 100 wrong recommendations before it gives you a first right one. So that is actually something that you can immediately uh, do away with because with Data Wallet, as I said, basically the data profile is like an online identity where you have, you have already created all of that data anyway. Just link it to the system and let it learn about you immediately. And that actually unlocks the utility of that platform right away. Other things, for instance, are psychographic hiring. Now, instead of, you know, you can take a Data Wallet profile, you can turn this, you can turn this into a psychographic profile, and you can do the same for an entire group of people. So imagine building a psychographic profile for an entire company, and each applicant you feed that into a neural network with the applicant's psychographic profile, it can tell you whether it's a good fit right away or not, right? So you know whether you're hiring a Mr. T or just a dude with a bunch of bling. Now, also personal auto insurance, right? I mean, there's insurances that allow you to download an app, you drive around with it for six months, it can give you a recommendation for an insurance plan. That is actually something, if that is collated with psychographic data and done for like 1,000 to 10,000 people, new people that now onboard don't have to drive around for six months. They link their psychographic profile, you get a high fidelity auto score right away. It's a matter of seconds. Same thing applies for psychographic credit scoring. We had the guys from Celsius up here a second ago, a couple of minutes ago. And uh, that is entirely feasible with that non-traditional financial data, social media data, um, and so on and so forth. So um, in summary, on the enterprise side and for developers, we deliver high quality data that stems from the person that created that data themselves. It is deterministically linked across platforms with 100% accuracy. For users, we're giving people back data ownership, the most important asset that they own. Uh, we're helping them unlock the utility of their data to actually make the data work for them. And we're helping you take that $10,000 and put it back into your own pockets. We are doing a token sale. Uh, the whitelist pre-sale uh, white pre will happen at the end of October. Um, if you reference, you can apply right now. Usually it's a 50K minimum to invest. If you go to our website and you sign up for that, just indicate BlockOn as the syndicate. No minimum required. And actually, we'll be pooling all of the investments we get from that group and we'll be applying a discount. So it's easier to get a higher discount. So uh, yeah, chat with us. We'll, we have a booth back there. We'd love to talk with all of you. Thanks for having us.